I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 299. We're in the third or fourth week, I'm not sure exactly which, of April 2022. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and the only wrestling podcast. We have WWE stuff to get into. They're building towards WrestleMania Backlash. They took like 33 weeks between pay-per-views for, sorry, premium live events for change. I'm not exactly sure why, but they are building towards WrestleMania Backlash. AEW and New Japan announced a joint pay-per-view. For the month of June, so more wrestling, <laughs> more wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> There's just more wrestling. Uh, you want to start with WWE stuff, or you want to start with AEW here? Uh, WWE stuff, I feel like is uh, is less fresh in my mind. So let's start there and, and get it out of the way. Sounds good. All right, so they're building towards WrestleMania backlash. The matches announced for this show so far are the Usos facing RK Bro in a tag team title unification match, uh, Edge versus AJ Styles Part Two. If the first one wasn't boring enough for you, <laughs> and Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes Two, which they uh, they built to this week on Raw by. Telling some stories and having Cody eke out a count out win over Kevin Owens. Guy who just lost to Steve Austin can't lose to the new top of the face on the brand. He, he has to do a count out finish. But. And, and who is currently feuding with like opening match comedy baby face Ezekiel. Yes. Uh, also announced for WrestleMania Backlash, uh, Charlotte Flair and Ronda Rousey in an I Quit match. Because they screwed up the first time. I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, there's even less of a reason for those two to be wrestling now, given that Charlotte just beat her last time. But uh, anyway, this WrestleMania Backlash build, not lighting my world on fire. They're not very serious about it. They still have weeks to go. Um, what jumps out at you about it? Uh, yeah, I thought the, the Cody, the Cody Seth stuff is it's fine. Like it's not. It's not good, but it's not, you know, it's not bad either. I was, I was a little surprised that they wouldn't just put Cody over Kevin Owens, but maybe that that's a feud in their mind for after the the Seth the second Seth match for Cody, and so they didn't want to have him beat him. Um, not that you know doing a clean finish ever prevents them from just booking the same match six more times any other time, but maybe that's that week they decided that this was an issue. So we had to, to not do a, a clean finish here. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you're not really, you're not really back in WWE until you do a good TV main event that has a terrible finish. So really this is the week that Cody Rhodes truly returned to, to world wrestling entertainment. And, uh, and that's, and that's good for him, but uh, yeah. Otherwise I think it's interesting that both last week's raw main event and then the SmackDown show, which is almost a week old at this point uh, was just mainly built around the Usos and RK bro. So my question is, is Roman going to wrestle on this show? (laughs) He's supposed Uh, to headline the show. I'm not entirely sure against who or whom uh, because they haven't begun to set up a program for him yet. Yeah, I just wonder, like, his complete lack of presence on the last couple of shows, if that wasn't just, like, maybe he was a little more banged up after WrestleMania than they wanted to let, to let on. So we're just kind of not setting anything up yet. And maybe, if necessary, we can leave him off the Backlash show if we have to. Um, but it's just like, it. Uh, yeah, I, th- I thought watching watching WWE television this past week it just feels like the the world the world title is not being pushed there's not really any obvious like oh these two people are are jockeying for a position for the world title shot or or oh this is going to get turned into a multi-man match and it's going to be you know some some combination of of raw or smackdown top guys like drew drew mcintyre's in a feud with Sami Zayn, (laughs) 
Yes. Um, and, and then you have Cody locked up with Seth. So that's two other, you know, main event guys. We, as we talked about, I think on our last show, they had sort of vaguely teased something with Nakamura, but also had Nakamura get completely laid out like the biggest loser. So that to yep. me didn't feel like they were really setting anything up beyond just having him come out to get <laughs> to have the Usos have someone to beat up that week. So I'm uh, I don't know. I just, that just doesn't feel like they're confident that Roman's going to be on that show. Bob Lashley's wrestling Omos. Mm-hmm. Again, we're just a lot of straight rematches, uh, I, which I guess is fine. But yeah, if if you were to tell me. I don't I don't know. I feel like people reporting that Roman is going to headline WrestleMania Backlash do not have the greatest track record <laughs> mm-hmm. of, of late when it comes to correctly predicting like this is the same. I can't bury my own website. <laughs> Dave reports that. Roman is headlining WrestleMania Backlash. Dave also reported that Brock Lesnar was going to be on WrestleMania Backlash because he was on the poster for it, even though they never announced a match for him. And then they're like, oh, Brock is not going to be at WrestleMania Backlash. So at this point, I'm not sure, man. It could be any number of a thousand things. (laughs) It really could. It really could. Yeah. Yeah. If you were to tell me he he was legit hurt in that WrestleMania match, I would believe you. I mean, that would make the the weird kind of out of nowhere finish mean a little bit more. And I know there was like he says something to Paul right before the finish about like his shoulder being out or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I know there was talk that like Brock got his bell rung in that match, too, or whatever. But then they didn't address it or or, uh, you know, pun, pun very much intended to acknowledge it on television the next week. But then he like I said, he was just kind of not really a presence other than him saying, Hey, Usos go win those red belts. Uh, hasn't really been, doesn't really feel like anyone's ready for him and all of the obvious people that you would pair him with, which again, are at this point are like Brock Lashley, Drew Cody are all, you know, otherwise engaged at the moment. So I guess they haven't announced that like Drew, Drew doesn't necessarily have a match at the pay-per-view yet. So they could still do Drew or, or Roman and Nakamura or whatever, if, if Roman is healthy, but it just, it just struck me as like, they've built every show around this guy for yes. years. And then this week, SmackDown being completely built around just the Usos and, and RK bro for the most part um, struck me as like, Oh, okay. So it feels like maybe Roman's not, maybe not going to be around for a couple of weeks here. It's also three weeks now past WrestleMania and we still don't know if the titles are going to be defended as one title, if the champion's going to go from brand to brand, if they're going to split them up again, we don't know. They just haven't even addressed it. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> I assume okay. because they don't know or they don't, <laughs> no one's bothered to ask the people in charge. <laughs> it's bizarre. Like, who, why should I care if you don't care? <laughs> if you're the company. Good question. <laughs> Uh, Edge and uh, Damian Priest have uh, they've aligned. <laughs> they're doing they're doing some acting every week. How do you feel about their uh, spooky promos <laughs> with uh, purple lighting and uh, Edge sitting in a throne and uh, Damian Priest reading off a teleprompter and Edge <laughs> acting and et cetera, et cetera? It's just like I I guess I just you off the air, but it's like. I couldn't have ever articulated like what is my ideal worst gimmick on a wrestling show, but somehow edge and this, and I, again, I still see this edge thing as like a takeoff of whatever Malachi black is doing in AEW. It's like somehow those two men reached into the deep recesses of my subconscious and pulled out the wrestling gimmick that I would personally find the most annoying yeah, and that is what Edge has done to me. And I like Edge. And I, I again, I've talked about this. I, I appreciate that he's really given it, given it his all <laughs> with this. Yep. He really is trying to commit to it, and I, I, I respect that. And I, I appreciate the effort being put in. And obviously, he has an idea that he wants to try to elevate the quote-unquote young guy 
uh, Damien Priest. <laughs> um, young, <laughs> young in TV years, I suppose, even though he's actually already been on Raw for like two years. But sure. um, theoretically, I like that idea. I appreciate it. But this, the spooky magic guy who's also, but, but I'm not just spooky magic guy. I also am cool and I wear a suit. I hate it. <laughs> Spooky magic guys should be, if you're going to have them on the show at all, they should be like Papa Shango or The Undertaker or Kane. Like, just do full gusto. Don't try to be like, oh, no, but I'm still cool. No, you got to commit to being the B-movie monster villain. Or you can be Nick Bockwinkle and wear a suit and use big words. You can't combine those things into one character. It's bad and it annoys me in a way that i cannot quite fathom wow we touched on a nerve there well <laughs> um they are uh, they're gonna wrestle aj styles so, uh... <laughs> maybe well now finn finn lost the u.s title this week so you could if edge doesn't want to do singles matches all summer you can you can throw finn and aj in a tag team and uh and they sure. can wrestle. They can wrestle Edge and, and Damian Priest there. Um, thing is, they love beating Finn Balor. It's maybe their favorite thing to mm-hmm. do. Well, this is perfect for them. Then you can just Damian and Edge can take turns pinning Finn. And you don't have to job out AJ, who's the one say, the one short guy Vince does like. <laughs> right. I was going to say that's the that's the catch is that they always do protect AJ. But uh, yeah, they do love Penny Finn. But who's the bigger geek in WWE, <laughs> Finn Balor or Ricochet? Ooh, hard to say. I mean, currently it feels like Finn yeah. because they did let Ricochet beat Ginger Mahal on SmackDown, and I didn't even think he was at that level. <laughs> yes. like I didn't even think they'd let him beat a guy they haven't pushed in four years now or whatever. Right. Um, so Ricochet did ascend to that level at least. So I think right now, surprisingly, it might be Finn Balor. But, you know, those two always jockeying for position. It's a very competitive <laughs> uh, position. Although yes. we should note that Finn is a really just a part-time wrestler now. He's full-time wife, <laughs> full-time wife guy, part-time pro wrestler now. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got to make some choices at some point. Yeah. And uh, he's made a choice. So. Okay, I think we've covered uh, uh, Bianca Belair is defending her title against Sony Deville on Raw this week in her hometown. A couple of ring generals. <laughs> Bianca's fantastic. Um, Sonia tries very hard, mm-hmm. and maybe at some point in her life could have been a good wrestler. And then, like, they had her not wrestle for like two years while she was. Um, after she was almost attacked and killed in her home and mm-hmm. was going through a court case about that. So I like Sonya as a person. I hope that uh, they have a good match on Monday. I'm not sure what they will. Yeah, I remember going to a SmackDown taping like four years ago, probably, <laughs> um, and seeing Asuka and Sonya in the dark match and going, man, Sonya's not there yet, but she's going to get there. And yeah. she never did. <laughs> and then she yeah. stopped wrestling for two years. And <laughs> also, I mean, again, we've, we've talked about this uh, probably a lot over the last couple of years, but the, the death of, of how shows did not help a lot of these people that had potential, but, you know, you didn't really get the reps in the ring. Yep. Um, doing, doing calisthenics at the performance center can only <laughs> prepare you so much for, for, uh, for wrestling. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see about that. Um, Doing that match now on television would tell me maybe they'll rematch Bianca and Becky at at the uh, at the pay per view then because Becky really hasn't been around since since the uh, since WrestleMania so yeah she hasn't been around at all yeah I think uh, I think they might be holding off on that one I don't know if that's I don't know if Becky's doing another project right now or not I kind of get the sense that she is but also everyone's being very cryptic about it so I'm not sure but. It feels like Rhea Ripley is probably next ah, for Bianca, actually. That's but. a good point. Yes, they did. They did turn Rhea. They broke up the horniest tag team <laughs> in WWE <laughs> and, uh, and broke up Rhea and Liv. And, uh, and yes, yeah, so now you got Rhea as, as, as the new heel that can wrestle Bianca in the meantime. 
So they gave Rhea and Liv absolutely nothing. They just threw them together as a tag team. Mm -hmm. They somehow they turned themselves into um, the favorite tag team of every hog cranking perv (laughs) that watches WWE. They became, as you mentioned, the horniest tag team (laughs) in pro wrestling. And think of the ground that covers. (laughs) I mean, we watch FTR every single week. That's right. (laughs) How, however, they got they started to get over, so they immediately broke them up. <laughs> and it's like the answer is well, they probably had this heel turn for Rhea Ripley planned a long time ago before they even threw Liv and Rhea together. But Liv and Rhea took something that was nothing, they made it something, and were immediately broken up. <laughs> yeah, classic. It's, it's tales all this time, as we like. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my, my last WWE note is that there was, there was a story this week uh, about Alexa Bliss. There's creative has nothing for her. Yeah. And, and, and I just thought between Spooky Edge and there's another spooky act waiting in the wings in NXT now. Like there's, I, there, we're, getting, we're getting to our spooky quota. <laughs> yeah. Vince doesn't really like, like to push more than like one, maybe two spooky acts if, if one's on each show sure so like and i know she sells they still sell a lot of those dolls and stuff but also they cut they cut bray wyatt last year and who yeah. who sold more, more merch for them than him outside of like john cena uh so i i feel like that's probably not a good sign if you're if you're the now the number three spooky act on the show that's probably not a good sign for for her but she's she's she should have had one foot out the door for quite a while now. And I feel like now that she's married a relatively famous musician from 15 years ago, uh, <laughs> that maybe she is officially now one foot out the door. But yeah, she apparently um, they, they brought her back for the Saudi Arabia show with a bunch of vignettes with her and a therapist. One of the worst actors ever seen on a wrestling show, by the way, that Pretty therapist bad. guy. Yeah. And think of the ground that covers. And <laughs> then they brought her back for Saudi Arabia. They had a wrestle one match. Then they had nothing for her. And apparently she went to Vince and was like, how do you have nothing for me? And uh, they have since had nothing for her since she voiced her displeasure. <laughs> so I would have thought that she would have been someone that could speak up to Vince, but apparently not. So you, you talk, talk ass, you get hit. <laughs> Apparently, it is fascinating because even if and and we've talked about this, I think on and off the show, she's had some injuries. She had a really bad injury. She was out of the ring for like almost a year, I want to say at one point or like six months at least. And so you can understand the idea of, okay, they don't want to use her as a full time wrestler anymore. But the character they had her in previously didn't wrestle hardly at all. And she like they built every show around her for like the yeah. entire pandemic era of the whole Thunderdome era of Raw. So I guess Vince just got bored with it, but also doesn't have any interest in turning her back into a wrestler. So you're in this weird middle ground and you would think, OK, well, then make her a GM, make her a manager, do something with her because she's, you know, she's a good television character, theoretically, even if she's she's she'd probably be a better television character if she wasn't doing the you know, the, the spooky stuff. So, but apparently, but maybe that goes along with her also being uh, vocal about not being happy with uh, doing weeks of vignettes to change her character and then coming back (laughs) to play that same character uh, from before the vignettes in one match lose (laughs) and then go home again. Yes. (laughs) Very bizarre. It's all very bizarre. Um. NXT this week was a horrendous television program. Like every week, it's usually just fine and it's there and it's it's inoffensive and there's nothing particularly good or particularly bad on it. It was a dreadful television program this week. And as you mentioned, they have a new uh, character who is uh, involved in the dark arts. <laughs> Joe Gacy. Harlan was not seen this week, by the way, with him. Harlan has been like his heavy um, who's there to do the the wrestling matches? Because Joe Gacy, yeah, uh, he, uh, he don't wrestle too good. <laughs> but Joe Gacy is going to challenge Braun Breaker 
for the NXT Championship, and they set this up by having Joe Gacy and Harland um, kidnap uh, Rick Steiner a few weeks ago, and they tied him up and put him in like a 1966 Batman show uh, <laughs> trap at the end of a show. Then the follow, and they stole his Hall of Fame ring. Then the following week, Joe Gacy um, melted the Hall of Fame ring in a fire and then reshaped it around his own finger. Uh, he burned himself. Anyway, that was the story. <laughs> and uh, this week, he dared Braun Breaker to find him backstage uh, in the very small uh, arena at the uh, Performance Center. Uh, Braun, <laughs> Braun failed. Broad failed. They did the Hogan Warrior 98 mirror sketch again. And um, at the end of the show, uh, Gacy shoved Braun off a, like a two foot platform. Uh, he fell. He took a flat back bump on the floor and then was like covered by um, hooded, uh, uh, creepy people. Um, just a disaster of a television show. And they are ruining Braun Breaker. And uh, what'd you think? I don't know. This washed over me in a way that I, I, I think because I'm, I'm even more divorced from, from caring about NXT than I am about regular WWE. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was bad and it was, it was, it was very silly. It reminded me, honestly, though, it's like how many times has Brock had to wrestle the undertaker over the years? Like for uh, whatever dozens, yeah. For whatever reason, they get like a legit athlete, a great amateur wrestler, who should be like, you know, take take everything pretty seriously. Do like he's an athlete and and put him in matches with other you know good athletes where he can throw people around. And then we always get to the point where we take the legit athlete and we got to put him in there and have him act and act scared against the spooky monster character. And we just, I don't know why, I don't know why, why that's like a hallmark of WWE television, but they like to take a legit, you know, badass guy and put him in the ring with the spooky, the spooky magic characters. And that's just, that, that just to me felt like, oh yeah, this is this, we're, we're doing Brock, we're doing Brock and the Undertaker again. I guess that makes sense. How would you categorize Braun Breaker's character? Because I got into a, I don't want to say an argument, but I was arguing with a coworker about this. And I was like, the gimmick is he's a shooter. And the guy's like, is that his gimmick? <laughs> like, well, to your point, they haven't really defined what his character is. He's just a dude. But like legit athlete slash shooter, I feel like are at least adjacent as gimmicks. And that's clearly mm-hmm. the gimmick. Right. Yeah. I mean, I feel like. WWE gives you a singlet. <laughs> you're yes. you're you're a shooter, right? Yes. Whether it's Jack Swagger, whether it's <laughs> Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas or Kurt Angle, like yes, if you get, if they put you in a singlet, your gimmick is big, big, you know, tough guy and and legit legit wrestler. Like so, yeah, that's that's how I've looked at. It. He's he's like yeah, he's he's angry, <laughs> he's angry, he's Rick Steiner with with Scott Steiner's voice. <laughs> Like yes, he's, he's an angry shooter without except without the the dog. Actually, no, he does the dog noises. <laughs> uh, so yeah, he doesn't he, he doesn't have the headgear or the collar, right? But yeah, that's yeah, he's not completely leaning into the the varsity uh, varsity club side of of the Steiner Steiner brothers gimmick. But yeah, he's he's the son of he's a son of a legit athlete and was a legit athlete himself. So yeah, that, that's that's how I've taken it. It's like yeah. He's an he's an angry man who is good at wrestling. <laughs> sure. The other problem here is that Bruce Pritchard has always loved shooters, and Vince McMahon has always hated shooters. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, oh man, it really is a miracle that Kurt Angle is like one of the biggest stars of the last twenty years, considering all he had going against him coming in. He's under six feet tall. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> His saving grace is he could do goofy comedy. Mm-hmm. Like, really? that That's what turned out to be his saving grace. But also the fact that everyone that ever stepped in the ring with him said he was the best guy they'd ever been in the ring with probably helped. Mm-hmm. All right. So that's WWE and NXT. Uh, not a whole lot going on. And we somehow managed to spend 25 minutes on it. But uh, <laughs> um, 
AEW, uh, actually, I guess kind of a bridge story here. Uh, FTR, they have more than a year left on their contract and an option year left on their contract. But it, there was a story this week that WWE has interest in them, which who, wh- what? <laughs> We are years away from this potentially happening. It, it's like the WWE wants MJF thing. It's like the mm-hmm. I don't think either one is going to be either act is going to be available until 2024. It's like what? Okay, <laughs> WWE wants WWE wants uh, FTR. Great. I'm sure AEW has interest in Becky Lynch. Like what? <laughs> like what? <laughs> I can't believe I accidentally just made a correlation between those two, but. <laughs> equal stars, equal talents. FDR, <sighs> Becky Lynch. Okay, but FDR. Uh, the, okay, so the, the the territory that hates ha- hates tag teams and doesn't like understand t- tag team wrestling wants it specifically hated them. Like like, like wanted yes. to dress them up in in <laughs> in colorful outfits with like cat in the hat hats. Yes. Um. Yeah, those people want they want those guys back. It's like, yeah, it's one of those things where I'm sure if Cody goes there and is a and has a lot of success, people are gonna look at that. And yes, if if in a year or two years now, for God's sake, uh MJF goes there and is successful, people will look at that and start you know assessing their options when their contracts come up. But for a tag team, I don't feel like those same options are on the table because you're still a tag team and a company that hates tag teams. I mean, the money might be good. And then maybe that's enough of a reason to go. If you're 39 or whatever, whatever, however old FDR are going to be when they, <laughs> when they get out of these AEW deals, maybe it would be worth it just to go, well, not going to enjoy this, but I'm going to make, I'm going to make, you know, $1.5 million over three years or whatever. Maybe right. that would make sense for them. But yeah, if you're, if you're looking for, I mean, that was kind of the whole point of, of them asking for a release and trying to get released. And in a time where WWE was very staunchly against releasing anyone. uh, Yeah, it was, it was because they didn't want to just take the money. They didn't, they weren't the good brothers who just took the money and then got cut anyway, six months later. Um, They specifically wanted out because they had some, you know, some wild oats to sow artistically speaking, I guess. (laughs) So, um, and then Good family men, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, but yeah, so I, I like, I, that was maybe the most interesting part of that story to me was like, well, like what if, unless they're just purely about, we got, we got one year left in us. Let's go take, let's go to the person that'll pay us the most money. I don't care how we're booked. That's like the only way that makes sense to me for, uh, somebody like FDR. But again, I think in a, in a post Cody, WWE world, any anyone that's contract, you know, starts to, to come loser is is near the end, is going to start, you know, looking over that way towards WWE to see who, you know, to see what what could happen if they went there. So yeah, I mean, it's 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 interesting, but it's also as you said, like two years out from being a relevant talking point. Those are also two tiny dudes. Which Brian, which reminds me, by the way, of the WWE wants MJF thing. It's like, oh, Bruce wants MJF. Mm-hmm. MJF's like five eight. It's like <laughs> Vince. Vince just tried to make LA Knight uh, 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 a manager, right? It's like I'm not mm-hmm. MJF and LA Knight. Mm-hmm. MJF's a better talker, but as a worker, I think, eh. I think he's a way better worker too. <laughs> Okay. I don't think I've ever seen an LA night match as good as the match MJF had with Darby or with Punk. That's fair. I don't think much of MJF as a worker. I don't think he's terrible. Mm -hmm. I just think he's, he's in his own words, mid as a worker. (laughs) But it's like, is Vince going to do anything with MJF if he's still running things in two years? Like, I I don't know. (laughs) Like, I don't think it's a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. Anyway. AEW and New Japan are running a uh, joint pay-per-view in the month of June. More hashtag content for all of us to enjoy. Um, I guess there's a lot of speculation that Okada and Omega is going to headline that show. I would expect Okada is going to be headlining it. 
And I guess it kind of depends on whether or not Omega is going to be back from all of his injuries uh, in two months. So uh, the Forbidden Door pay-per-view, it was the rumor for several weeks, and um, yeah, it's happening. Yeah, uh, this this launched what uh, what is my favorite thing on on all of of, of wrestling uh, punditry which is uh, the way that wrestling uh, people talk about the mythical casual fan um, in the same way that like you might hear CNN discuss like factory workers in the Midwest. Like they don't really have anything other than just to go, well, will this play well with, with this person, this imaginary person that I've made up in my head who likes wrestling and watch would watch AEW, but is also completely afraid of seeing anyone they don't recognize that isn't introduced by 12 weeks of vignettes first. Uh, yeah. So that, that was my favorite part of the announcement was just uh, was a lot of, a lot of ca- casual fan discourse uh, surrounding it. But yeah, as, as, as far as the event goes, I feel like these joint shows, if you've seen, like say, if you saw the, the new Japan Noah show earlier this year, mm. um, it's going to be, I think, a lot of baby faces from both companies and in a tag team wrestling heels from both companies and tag team. And then maybe you have a couple sing- marquee singles matches. But again, it always comes down to who is comfortable letting their guy get beat. And obviously, like New Japan, don't give a don't give a crap about like letting you beat Suzuki or letting you beat Tanahashi. They should. <laughs> But they, right. but they don't. Right. But when it comes to yeah, if you do Okada versus Omega, or if you do, I don't know, uh, you know, Naito versus Hangman Page or something like, if you do those matches, that's where it gets a little dicier. Right. And uh, um, but I think to me, the only one that I feel like is a slam dunk is or that they should do just just because is do Punk and Kenta. Sure. Right, Why not? Like that's that's an obvious one, and like, who cares if you beat Kenta? <laughs> right, yeah. P- Punk's definitely not doing no jobs. <laughs> not not in Chicago in in the big arena. Yeah. So, uh, other than that, there's really kind of like a shocking, not a whole lot happening on this week's Uncle Tony's Cocaine Circus. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I liked the opener with, with Punk and Punk's latest Bret Hart tribute match that he did on, on Dynamite this week with Dustin. I enjoyed. And then we did get the official confirmation that they're going for, for Hangman and Punk at the pay-per-view. Um, but other than that, I, I didn't think it was a particularly like good or bad show. It felt like they were, they were still wrapping up storylines that won't continue to the pay-per-view. It's like they did the Darby Andrade blow off? I guess they're doing a ladder match for the TNT title next week, um, which you would be forgiven if you didn't notice because Sammy Guevara <laughs> forgot to say that it was a ladder match until they were playing his music and they were about to cut away. Oh. Um, yeah, that's 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 been fun watching <laughs> watching people slowly come to the realization that Sammy Guevara is really unlikable. <laughs> well. Everyone except the promotion, apparently. I mean, to the to the promotion's credit, they did realize it on like the third week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think most people knew from before the first week that Sammy Guevara is extremely unlikable, a natural heel. And if you put him with Tay Conti on television, they are going to be monster heels. But they didn't realize that until the third week. Yeah, I mean that being said, I think I think we're getting our our we're getting it together now. Although it does appear that like, are we turn are we turning the Lambert crew babyface <laughs> out I of this feel, as well? I feel like that's probably just maybe for this feud. Okay, that's fair and fine. As long as look, as long as we get to my dream match of Ethan Page Van Zant. <laughs> That's that's my dream team still, just for the name. Uh, so as long as we're getting towards that, that's all I uh, that's all I care about. But yeah, otherwise, like I, I didn't think Dynamite was was a particularly bad. Show. They brought Britt out. They were in Pittsburgh. She'd been off TV for like a month, 
And I thought she cut a promo that was really bizarre. <laughs> um, like not very good. And then she's just kind of burying people. Like some of them were people that I guess she could be wrestling in the tournament because she, she won a qualifier for the Owen tournament. But I just thought that was like, it, it, yeah, once again, we, we finished the, the battle of the belt cycle and the champion, much like in the men's division, the champion is not the top pushed star right. in that division. Yes. So uh, Thunder Rosa got like a 30 second video promo and then Britt Baker got the, the star entrance with the Pittsburgh Steelers coming out with her and then and then got to cut the promo afterwards. So, yeah, I guess we're we're slowly building up to this to this Owen tournament. There's going to be like five people in the actual tournament because they keep calling everything qualifying matches. And I'm like, why didn't you just say these were all first round matches? But maybe I don't know. I don't think they know. I don't think they know how many people are in the tournament. Uh, They've yet to reveal bracket um, either on the men's side or the women's side. And, uh, you know, I think they're just uh, they're just doing what they do, flying by the seat of their pants. Just vibes. <laughs> First ever <laughs> wrestling tournament looked exclusively on vibes. Yes, that's that's a, a perfect way to put it. <laughs> How many people are in this? Uh, you know, well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what feels right, brother. I mean, tournaments are fun because generally you get to set up matches that you, or if you do them right you can train your audience to be like, oh, a tournament means you're going to get exciting matches that you won't ever see otherwise. Like they're doing the two FDRs against each other. Um, Like that's fun. Like, I don't know what it will be like as a match, but like, it's like that kind of stuff. I think that part of it, of training your audience to be like, hey, not only is this tournament cool because we have Owen Hart's name attached to it, but you're going to get to see some like weird matches that you'll never, that you won't get to see the other you know, 11 months of the year or whatever. But yeah, in the meantime, we're just doing, we're just doing these qualifiers and we'll, uh, we'll figure out the rest down the road. So I guess they did say that the finals are at the pay-per-view. So mm-hmm. we have five, five weeks till the finals, but yeah, still no indication of how many people are in the tournament. It's great. Mm-hmm. It's great. So NXT does this thing every week where they, they try to put uh, Nikita Lyons and Lash Legend in the same segment. Mm-hmm. Uh, like on this this coming Tuesday's uh, um, NXT, they're wrestling each other. But really, this is just, it's just a um, it's just to get social media extremely horny. Sure, um, sure. By putting those those two in the same segment together, and I feel like AEW is doing a higher end version of that with Tony Storm and Jamie Hader every week. <laughs> uh yeah i mean they definitely they definitely the same type of person that gets real <laughs> real excited about jamie hater matches tends to feel the same way about tony storm matches i think uh so yeah i think i think you're onto something there yeah yeah all right uh anything else you want to get into uh no i think we've uh, we've covered lots of ground and we're just in this weird middling space of the year for both companies so it's there's a bunch of stuff announced we we love we love announcements don't we folks but oh, we we're sure but we're not doesn't really feel like we're we're on the cusp of anything really big so hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll have a, a little bit more to sink our teeth into but you know let's be honest we never have trouble fin- filling uh at 30 to 45 minutes on this show whether uh whether we we have a lot to talk about or not that's true let me just uh, casually drop in that I met Tony Storm and it was extremely it was extremely unremarkable. <laughs> uh, Juice Robinson was also there and uh, everyone was very nice. And um, yeah, that's and all you I big, got. You big time Juice on the way out. I, well, I did. I was very nice to Juice. <laughs> I first thing I did when I saw them was I shouted juice. <laughs> I didn't know he was going to be there. As far as I know, he wasn't advertised as signing. And as far as I know, he was signing because he was like sitting at the anyway. It was a nice experience. Everyone was very nice. That's all I got. Oh, there you go. But, yeah. Till next time, everybody. I'm Ethan. I'm Liam. 
And we'll, we'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Okay. Number 300 next time. Four Gonna nine. get those clicks. Stupid. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. <laughs> You know, of all the ways <laughs> psychosis could rear its head, that's not the worst, I can <laughs> imagine. Uh, how's things going? Oh, you know, we're we're we out here. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> we are in fact out here. <laughs> yeah, it's been a uh it's been a really interesting week. My uh, my boss uh, cut her thumb off, and whoa, it, it got started back on. But she did cut her thumb off <laughs> briefly. Uh, when, when they sew it back on, do you still get the fe- keep all the the feeling in it? Uh that's a good question. It hurts a lot. She told me. So <laughs> holy crap! She like yeah. I don't know exactly at what point she cut it off, but. Uh, yeah, it was uh, apparently a big accident on Sunday. So she was out all week until uh, today was her first day back. And, uh, and are we, uh, are we talking like half of, of we talking the tip or are we talking half of, you know, down was, to the, I would say down, to, down to, yeah, down to like the first, uh, first holy yeah. crap. <laughs> yeah. That is, that is intense. Yeah. A lot of stitches. It was fascinating. I try to keep on keeping on.